Hello, TechX, and welcome to the impact of the impact of transistors, past, present, and future. Let that die down for a second. There we go. The impact of transistors, past, present, and future. We have some echo. No? OK, so it's just me. Uh, I'm, I'm Ryan Bales, president-elect of IEEE Ada Kappa Nu. And joining us today, we have two experts in the field of transistor technology and power electronics. Dr. Fernando Guarín, a IEEE fellow and distinguished lecturer with a long history of service to the IEEE Electron Devices Society. And Dr. Prasad Nzidi, an IEEE fellow and the Texas Instruments at Kilby Chair in the Department of ECE at Texas A&M University. The transistor developed by John Bardini, Walter Bertain, and William Shockley at Bell Labs happened in 1947 and just celebrated its 75th anniversary. As many of you probably saw, there was an excellent series of articles in IEEE Spectrum late last year commemorating the occasion, and the Electron Devices Society is hosting several seminars and events throughout the end of the year. Uh, Dr. Guarini is going to share with us an overview of the history of the transistor from its conception to some of the devices we recognize today. Uh, 75 years in a span of 20 minutes, with a compression ratio of about 2 million to 1. So if you're sitting in a chair that has a seat belt, you might want to strap in. Then Dr. Njeti will share some of the modern uh, applications and technologies related to power transistors and electronics, and tying in with the previous talk on AI, has some thoughts to share on generative AI and its effect on publishing. Uh, as usual, please post any questions you have into the chat window, and we'll answer as many of those as we can as we go along. Uh, so start to start things off. Um, let's see, we'll uh, we'll switch to uh, Dr. Guarine. Are you ready? Uh, yes, I am. Uh, thank you, Ryan. Uh, good afternoon, uh, evening, morning uh, to all, and uh, it's a pleasure to be here. So thank you so much for the invitation. So as uh, it was indicated, it's a pretty high compression ratio. So I'm just going to to go ahead and uh, share my screen and uh, we'll get going with our presentation. Um, and I'll just ask uh, for a very brief, uh, um, uh, I guess you you can see my screen full, uh, full on, right? Uh, is that correct? Mm, uh, can you acknowledge that uh, you are seeing my screen? Uh, I, I don't see any slides yet. Okay, so I'm sharing my full screen. Let me see if if it, if it is just a, an issue. With the, uh, sometimes you have to. Oh, I have to. Uh, it wants us to entire screen. Sorry. Uh, so yeah. so you have to select that. Okay. There's so many different platforms that we use nowadays. There we have it. Uh, uh, yes, perfect. OK. Um, so so with that, uh, you know, we uh, are celebrating, uh, although we're in the 76th uh, year, but uh, it was uh, December of uh, 1947. So, so we're celebrating uh, both years. So we can see, you know, that we've come a long way on how we fabricate and uh, the role of transistors in society is unquestionable. So it really, uh, it, it was uh, uh, the invention of proven concept uh, was uh, uh, carried out uh, at Bell Labs in December 23rd, 1947. And it was John Bardeen and uh, uh, Walter Bertain actually were the two that did the first demonstration. And uh, Bill Shockley, as we'll see a little bit later, uh, was a manager and he was at it later on. And he made some significant contributions as well. So so the first point contact transistor was a PMP germanium transistor. Uh, it uh, showed amplification with a gain of 18. And for this work, they received the Nobel Prize in Physics in 1956. So while fragile in appearance, it really uh, has uh, had phenomenal impact in the world. And uh, all the early transistors uh, were um, in the 50s and early 60s were germanium. It, it does have the problem that it, oxides are water soluble. So, so uh, we were all very happy to switch to silicon. 
But uh, the story goes back a little bit uh, if we delve into electronics. So the first uh, uh, diode, you know, so it was a valve, as they call it, um, uh, since it was a, a diode. In 1904, it uh, was the patent by um, uh, Fleming. And uh, he worked uh, for both Marconi and Edison. Uh, so we see a picture of uh, his first patent. And just two years later, uh, Lee DeForest um, uh, patented the, what he called the Audion, which was later on known as the triode. And, and it's really what we know uh, today, uh, preamble to, to the transistor. Um, there was a, a long discussion. Uh, and by the way, he was a Medal of Honor recipient for IEEE in 1922. And they had a, a long uh, running dispute between Fleming and the forest as to who the inventor of the vacuum tube was. Uh, at the end, you know, they settled and they both cross license uh, patents. Uh, and the patent was bought by Marconi, so it was no longer Fleming's. Um, but anyway, so so this is uh, it, what set the stage uh, for what was to come. Now we go back. Actually, the first transistor, as we know today, uh, FET, was patented way back in 1926. While well, he's uh, in the computer. History Museum, they refer to him as Polish-American. He was uh, born in the Austro-Hungarian Empire. And um, in uh, 1926, he filed uh, for this patent. Uh, there was uh, a few other works, like with all developments uh, in, in electronics and in modern science, uh, many people that contribute. And uh, who gets credited, it's always a little bit dicey and depends who you ask. But we've been going by the first patent uh, throughout uh, this uh, uh, description. So uh, we see that in 1926, so this year we celebrate 97 years since the actual invention of the field effect transistor. And for the contact transistor, it's uh, 76 years, the bipolar transistor, which is um, it, we celebrate the reduction to practice in the, the first uh, demonstration. And uh, as we will see, uh, it took uh, many years uh, to get uh, uh, Lil and Fiddle's, uh, uh work uh, to be able to produce a viable transistor. So throughout the 19, uh, you know, uh, the early 19, uh, hundreds uh, to 1950s, uh, vacuum tubes, uh, were really the way electronics was uh, practiced. And they revolutionized uh, wireless communications. They enabled the development of uh, uh, wireless communications, radio, TV, computing, many other applications. Um, so, um, uh, but uh, they had several drawbacks. Uh, they were bulky, expensive, uh, very power hungry and unreliable, you know, being uh, mechanical and uh, heating up so much uh, and uh, having uh, uh, thermal cycling was uh, quite hard on, on this uh, system. Therefore, there was a large incentive to develop a solid state uh, solution. And um, that's why in 1947, uh, John Bardeen and Walter Bertin uh, demonstrated this first uh, PMP uh, transistor. And for that, they were awarded the Nobel Prize. And we should point out that uh, John Bardeen is the only person uh, to ever receive two Nobel Prizes in physics. Uh, his second was in superconductivity uh, in 1972. So he was a very prolific inventor. Uh, well, uh, William Shockley, he, uh, his contribution was the junction transistor, which is a transistor as we know today, rather than the point contact that was demonstrated uh, uh, here. He was a controversial uh, figure because of his beliefs in, in, in race theory and other things that, that don't come to the story. Uh, but nevertheless, he was a very brilliant scientist. Which brings us to 1958 in at Texas Instruments, uh, Jack Kilby. Uh, he filed for the first patent on, on the integrated circuit. So um, so this was uh, quite an accomplishment. Well, it looks uh, a bit rudimentary. It, it really uh, is set up uh, in motion this whole semiconductor industry that we know today. And it was uh, Gene Ernie uh, working at Fairchild Semiconductor who patented the planar process so by which you could grow on a single slab of silicon deposit the oxide and be able to deposit 
uh, metal layers and subsequent uh, layers on top. So, so it's a lot closer to what we know today as an integrated circuit. And in 1959, uh, Bob Noyce, uh, Robert Noyce, um, he um, put off also a patent um, in, um, in as an integrated circuit. Uh, so while Kilby's uh, uh, patent uh, was uh, first, we see that, uh, you know, pretty much the Kilby's, um, uh, uh, you know, and uh, uh, what uh, Fairchild did with the planar process is truly enabled the semiconductors as we know today. Uh, Bob Noyce went on to uh, found uh, Fairchild and Intel. And he was uh, known as one of the traitors eight by uh, Shockley. Uh, Bill Shockley had uh, founded a company called Shockley uh, uh, Semiconductors. And this eight gentlemen, you know, they, they left uh, to create uh, uh, Fairchild, uh, and uh, you can see, you know, from Gordon Moore, uh, a, a, you know, uh, Bob Noyce, uh, a Gene Erdney, who invented the planar process, etc. So it's a tremendous time uh, uh, for innovation, and uh, um, uh, Fairchild has a, a big claim to to the start of this whole industry. And right there at uh, at, at Bell Labs, once again, uh, Atala in uh, Kang, um, they achieved what uh, had been proposed by Lillenfeld in 1926. Uh, they were able to finally uh, fabricate a working uh, FET. A prior error, uh, prior uh, in, in intents were not successful as uh, the quality of the materials uh, was uh, too uh, trappy, too many interface traps, so, so nobody could make a viable transistor until uh, they took advantage of uh, Ernie's uh, planar process in much cleaner way to grow uh, devices so they could uh, uh, build a successful um, MOS transistor. And this opened the gates uh, for um, MOS and CMOS as we know them today. So if we look at the transistor timeline, you know, this is uh, Swiss published in Spectrum. You know, we go all the way from the first point contract uh, transistor in 1947. Um, you, you know, the time it, they were commercialized for a very short time. You know, they, they went through uh, junction transistors, which was uh, really Shockley's contribution. And we go all the way through However, I find that there is a, a serious uh, mistake in that because the invention of the of the FET took place in 1926. So, so this is, I think, a more accurate uh, timeline for the transistor history. So, the history of electron devices uh, goes then all the way back to Fleming's uh, uh, valve and the invention of uh, triad by the forest and going through all the different iterations, the, the MOSFET invention in 26, but really the first uh, uh, working uh, transistor in the modern era uh, at Bell Labs. And from there on, you know, the invention of the integrated circuit, the large scale integration and later uh, very large scale and ultra large, you know, so as known as VLSI. So, so, so we can see uh, the incubation time for each of this. And uh, so this has uh, enabled uh, the electronic circuits uh, uh, to go along a, a very uh, fast trajectory. And we can see that the foundation of full modern electronics goes back to, to the transistor. Um, and uh, from the first uh, controller made at Intel in uh, 1972, uh, the 4004, all the way to, to the uh, latest uh, transistors doubling every uh, two years, roughly, as predicted by Moore's law. And then more uh, recently, the telephony going from 1G, every uh, 10 years, basically, we introduce a, a new generation. So we're in 5G, and there's already uh, 6G in the works. So we go uh, and uh, look at how um, the price per trillion transistors, how it has dropped from way back in the early uh, 1950s, early days uh, to today's, you know, where it really is a tremendous, you know, uh, a almost 10, 11 orders of magnitude in, in drop. Um, and uh, likewise, the number of transistors uh, sold 
really increase. And I always ask people uh, to count how many millions and billions of transistors they carry in their pocket today, just in their cell phones. So um, the number of transistors in a CPU has uh, continually uh, been increasing uh, throughout the years. And if we look at the semiconductor industry, uh, from um, it has had a tremendous um, growth from the early age of the mainframe uh, uh, to the digital generated data. And now either artificial intelligence, quantum computing, uh, different uh, uh, versions that we're seeing uh, nowadays. So you can see that there's a, a large percentage of, uh, of cells for uh, MPUs and high logic are the ones that uh, uh, are have the wider piece of the pie. However, uh, memories and as well as uh, discrete opto sensors have each a significant share. In, and the market uh, share uh, today is around 800, uh, between six, 700 uh, 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 billion dollars. So if we look, uh, and this is a couple of years old, uh, but uh, by revenue, uh, Samsung uh, followed by Intel. Actually last year, uh, TSMC surpassed uh, Intel. So it's a very dynamic uh, industry. Things are always uh, uh, coming along and things uh, change as we're gonna see in a couple of slides. So at this point in time, I'd like to introduce you uh, to the semiconductor supply chain, you know, which is uh, uh, Foundry, IDM, and and Fabless. So uh, Foundry is what we call a pure play Foundry. So it's a company that does not offer a significant amount of uh, IC products of their own design. They're not going to be competing with the people they're going to be fabricating uh, chips for and uh, they operate uh, fabrication plants focus, focused on, on producing for their customers. So uh, such is the case as uh, TSMC, Global Foundries, UMC, and more recently SMIC in China. So, so they play a crucial role and is something that came out, um, uh, you know, for about 30 years ago that we started with this uh, concept of uh, pure play foundries. Um, then we have what we call IDMs or integrated device manufacturers. So they offer foundry services as long as they don't conflict with their own uh, product set. And in this case, we have Intel, Samsung, uh, TI. And then uh, we have the fabulous companies. Uh, so our companies that outsource production to a third party, uh, such as the case for AMD, NVIDIA, Qualcomm, it's a very fluid situation like um, AMD uh, used to have global foundries was their fabricator. They spun it off. Uh, and uh, so the roles are always continuously shifting. Um, IBM, uh, you know, uh, got out of the microelectronics business. Uh, so they went uh, from IBM and spun off to, to uh, Global Foundries uh, to cover their microelectronics division, which is where I, I worked uh, at IBM for the 28 years and then seven years at Global Foundries. So, um, so as I indicated, it came from the AMD fab and the, it transitioned in that way. And it's always um, a, 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 a dynamic and uh, quite an uh, intertwined industry. For instance, uh, Intel uses TSMC either when they need uh, uh, to get uh, more chips and advanced nodes or to shell out the production where they don't have capacity. Uh, so uh, things uh, shift and alliances uh, come and go. Um, so you can see pretty much the ecosystem here. So it's from IP cores, really, which are the tools that you need to design the chips. And, um, and, and to produce, uh, so, so you have the EDA software, the material suppliers, you need very high purity materials. Uh, and then those provided of uh, uh, providers of wafer fab equipment. There are some bottlenecks as we all know for lithography, ASML has gained uh, um, a lot of uh, preponderance uh, lately. And then you have your fabless and IDM uh, companies and uh, your, uh, foundries. So, um, so it's a, a very complex ecosystem. So it is innovation that keeps the engine uh, growing. So, so if we look at, um, you know, uh, it was scaling, always uh, making the chips uh, smaller 
and mostly for uh, MOS scaling, it was always uh, if you decrease the the distance from source to drain, electrons travel a shorter path, and therefore you could always make your chips faster just by making the geometry smaller. And this is what we call the traditional gain. But as we can see uh, lately, starting you know with the 130 nanometer uh, node and 90, uh, the gain from uh, by just uh, scaling was not as significant as the gain that came more by innovation. So we started to to put uh, uh, stress and strain in, in the silicon to increase mobility. Uh, we went to high K uh, metal gate uh, 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 to uh, overcome uh, thickness of oxide. Uh, then we came to uh, to multi gate and uh, FinFET uh, transistors and nanowire. So it's been innovation that has enabled the the most of the recent gain. And I just want you to stop for a second and let's visualize the journey of a typical chip. So let's have a chip made uh, by a Japanese owned company based in Cambridge, uh, UK, called ARM. You know, which is manufactures many of the chips for. Uh, cell phones. So, so this chip is designed by a team of engineers in California and Israel. They use uh, software tools from uh, U.S. companies uh, for the design of the chips. They sent them in turn to a fab lab in Taiwan, where it's fabricated into a chip. It, this fab uses um, ultra pure silicon uh, wafers and high purity gases to manufacture. It, it usually come from Japan or uh, California. And they use very precise machinery, um, like uh, from a Dutch to, to for lithography, uh, to etch, deposit, and measure. And um, at the end, you know, the chip is packaged and tested in, in South Asia. And uh, finally, it's sent to China for assembly into a phone or a computer. So as you can see, it's it's truly a global uh, enterprise. Uh, there's no, and um, with this recent, um, a, a geopolitical situations, uh, we're just going to see that uh, the chips are crucial not only to smartphones and computers, they are widely used in advanced weapons, surve surveillance technology, satellites, communication infrastructure, in renewable energy, um, as, as well as many other applications. So this is the only sector in which China depends on the rest of the world. And they spend more money on chips than importing oil. And they had a 2025 initiative to be self-sufficient in chips by 2025. Uh, through recent political maneuvering, you know, there's uh, uh, challenges to some of these uh, timelines. At the end of the day is whoever has the technological supremacy is going to be a superpower in AI is uh, becoming increasingly important. If Taiwan were to be invaded, we would suffer, it, it would be worse than the Great Depression. Uh, the, a lot of the chips that uh, the world depends on, uh, which is nobody would be able to, to have them. Uh, some people call this the Silicon Shield, and this is the reason China will not invade uh, Taiwan, but this is uh, more, you know, it's uh, a topic for a much bigger uh, discussion. Right now, we only have three major supplies, uh, suppliers capable of fabricating, you know, sub seven nanometer uh, chips, and these are Samsung, Intel, and TSMC. And I think um, all these uh, coherent restrictions uh, it has been, they have been placed and there's a chips act uh, in the us and uh, there's a european version of the chip that chips act uh, being drafted so um how successful they will be uh, that's still a question to be answered the only thing that i ask you to think about is the large investment of cap capital infrastructure uh, and the talent that you need is not only building the fabs it's having the people that have the education and know how to uh, run the fabs and how to design the chips. So just imagine what would happen uh, to the world if there was only one uh, fabricator left. And with that, you know, uh, we can just turn and see the many, uh, the large impact to society, you know, from all areas uh, of human activity, energy, information technology, um, 
you know, all the way to social issues. Uh, can you imagine the pandemic if we did not have the wired infrastructure that we have and to the maturity levels that we had them? It would have been uh, uh, far more devastating than, than it was and challenging that, than it was. Uh, so there are many, many areas in which uh, uh, semiconductor technology and transistors have brought about uh, changes to, to society. Um, so I think um, it's um, we've changed the world in many areas and the pace of innovation, uh, it's uh, quite challenging and it takes a lot of investment to, to make a successful semiconductor uh, technology. And the choke point is uh, lithography. And as we know, the Dutch company ASML has the, the, the monopoly right now on these machines. Education will continue to be key, innovation, and there are opportunities, you know, for many countries, and it's a very interconnected uh, industry, and uh, we all have a role to play in this. So with that, thank you very much, and it was a high compression ratio, and I think I three, four more minutes than I intended to, but thank you all very much for your attention. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Gorin. That was uh, that was fantastic. Yeah, the the economic impact of the transistor industry in general is is wild to think about. Not just in terms of you know sales of the devices, but the uh, the economic impact on all the other industries that depend on on those devices as well. So it's uh, it's definitely a uh, uh, much more than just a technological uh, uh, interest. So thank you. Yeah, you're very welcome, Ryan. Uh, so next we'll we'll listen to. Uh, to Dr. Njeti about uh, some applications of of uh, power electronics and transistors, and also some uh, some emerging AI applications. Uh, hello. Hello. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening. <laughs> Whatever time it is. Yeah. No. Okay. So it's it's all yours. Uh, thank you again. Uh, it was, it's a pleasure to just uh, follow for that uh, Darren's presentation into the dive into more higher power kind of applications. So my name is Prasad Njadi. I'm at the Texas A&M University. So I would uh, follow up on his presentation, saying that the first bipolar, as he introduced, was in 1947. And then came uh, the bipolar power transistors, uh, or bipolar transistor came in 1960. So. Uh, for applications involving high power levels, that's essentially my research area or application area. It's uh, it's the the electronic switch, uh, you know, needs to have these uh, these kind of characteristics. They should have a high voltage blocking capability, low on state volt, you know, voltage drop to reduce conduction losses, fast switching capability, a voltage and current to minimize switching losses and then ability to tolerate simultaneous imposition of high voltage and current during the switching transients. So you want to spend as little time as possible in the in this mode that accumulates switching losses. And then the control of current using small voltages so that we can have a high gain. And then uh, with low voltage circuits, we can control much, much higher, higher power. So keeping that, I think uh, the device manufacture, the, the device progression after the transistors start, started to go in this path. So 1960 or so, the, the bipolar transistor um, was put in place. Uh, this is a, essentially a chronology of some discrete power devices as, as, for, as Dr. Garin took us from 1947 uh, and then towards the uh, power transistors. Uh, so I would go, go with this uh, evolution of power bipolar transistors from the 60s, mm -hmm. and the six, and then during the 70s we got into power Darlingtons, essentially to uh, to you know amplify the current or reduce the the to increase the gain between the gate and then the collector current, and then also um, have a diode here for for the power circuits to to carry the inductive loads. But most of the circuits which are controlling the power are inductive. Uh, the motors have inductances. So uh, the device have to be capable for that. So after that, in the 1970s or so, we got into um, uh, MOSFETs for both signal and power, power aspects of it. So specifically for power control, 
uh, the MOSFETs essentially changed, you know, were uh, you know, more more of a, a D MOSFET and U MOSFET, where they were splitting the gate to increase the um, reliability as well as the gain. And um, then came the uh, 80s or so was the invention of IGBT uh, in General Electric by uh, by uh, Jan Polliger. He's a professor at NC State, uh, even serving this uh, NC State even now. So the so this here there was a unique combination of MOSFET and the transistor bipolar transistor together to actually to to get a uh, introduce a MOS channel and um, uh, have a MOSFET like behavior from the gate as well as a transistor like behavior from the collector to emitter. Uh, this gained uh, quite a bit of popularity. The main um, uh, uh, criticism of this in the initial stages was its uh, uh, latch up because there was a PNPN junction, which could latch up and then be an uncontrolled device. Uh, through through research and development, this uh, latch up issue was uh, was solved and commercially um, uh, producible and quickly got adapted into uh, many, many uh, come up applications, which I have a few slides later on, how the IGBT kind of uh, pro progressed and, re and improved a lot of power conversion, saved uh, quite a bit of carbon emissions, uh, energy efficiency, and so on, electronic control. And has also permitted the digitization of uh, energy. So, so, so the next big, big leap was uh, has been a possible, uh, you know, back in, from the 90s is the evolution of wide band gap devices, essentially silicon carbide and then uh, uh, gallium nitride type of devices. So they are taking the, the power, power uh, switching devices to higher voltage, higher current, as well as higher temperature um, with higher efficiencies. So uh, with the evolution of silicon carbide um, came to came with uh, gallium nitride lat lat lateral high electronic mobility transistor uh, power device soon to be called by you know GAN. So the so the GAN has progressed quite well from 50 volts to today 2023. Uh, we are able to get uh, uh, 650 volt, you know, could be more than 100 amperes GAN transistor devices commercially available. So they have enabled quite a bit of um, power conversion applications. If you are using a cell phone charger, a laptop charger, uh, perhaps you could purchase a 660 watt to 100 watt laptop charger. Um, you know, much much smaller, uh, you know, print or footprint from Amazon. Uh, you, it, it would say GAN devices, and Apple and uh, many of these devices, many of these manufacturers use uh, very low, low, high, high power density uh, chargers in their, um, uh, you know, MacBook Air and, and so on. So GAN is actually GAN and silicon carbide are, are carrying out their evolution, continuing this, and what's in the horizon is. Um, then so several new power devices in the horizon, which I've not put forward here, but as far as younger audience, you have to look forward. So the, the, this is a continuous improvement in the power conversion area. So uh, and in the application of power transistors, if you can look at the x, uh, you know, the x-axis being the being the uh, operating voltage and the y-axis being the uh, power or watts. So you can see at the lower um, um, so I think the x-axis frequency. So uh, lower frequency, higher power is silicon control rectifiers, and then you have gate turn off thyristors. These these are essentially gone to the utility utility level applications, high voltage DC transmission, or so to speak. And then the bipolar transistors are, are, are were occupying a larger space, so it's, it's been displaced by the by the IGBT in uh, uninterrupted power supplies. Robotic, robotics, you know, welders, automotives, and EVs are where IGBTs are now getting replaced by silicon carbide, MOSFETs, switch mode power supplies, 
including the audio amplifiers, are, are, are being displaced by, by uh, MOSFET transistors. So, uh, so it's been a continuous evolution, and then air conditioning systems and uh, whatnot. So you, you have, um, it is said that the power, every, uh, every electron passes through some kind of a transistor before it goes to an end application. And um, uh, another uh, graph which shows the frequency versus the output capacity, you can see again the traction, electric trains and windmills and the EV revolution, transportation electrification, which we are uh, going through right now. The new Biden uh, uh, White House initiatives by 2032, two thirds of the EVs are, are expected to be, two thirds of the cars are expected, automobiles are expected to be EVs. So that will kickstart a lot of this uh, revolution as well, including all the appliances uh, and, and then many of them. So the few applications which I'll like to go through is the application of motor speed control. Before the power of electronic control was available, the induction motor was essentially a fixed speed, a workhorse of the industry was a fixed speed device whose water, who's pumping some water and the water flow could be only controlled by a damper or a wall. So it's equivalent to controlling a current in a circuit by, by, by means of adjusting a resistor which is the very lossy way of, um, of, of controlling the flow of current. So then came the adjustable speed drive where you don't get rid of the damper or the wall and then purchase an electronic controller for hundreds of kilowatts of power to be processed from the input three phase AC down to, to the commercial motor with efficiencies of the box, electronic box going, it says greater than 90% here, but today's technology is can, has taken it to 98 percent, and um, uh, uh, so the wind, the, the wind applications. Um, this, this is a direct wind drive where the wind energy is is going through a generator, which produces variable voltage and variable frequency because the wind speed is changing. The power and uh, energy produced, electrical energy is produced, is converted first to DC, and then the DC is converted back to AC. And all of this power electronic uh, the unit is actually on the nestle on the top of the tower. And then the transformer is usually on the bottom. So currently the transformer uh, is 60 hertz, uh, which is also getting transformed into a solid state transformer with a higher frequency operation. So, so every part of the system is getting uh, transformed by, by the power, by, by the transistors and then making the devices lighter weight and in increasing the density and improving the, improving the efficiency of our conversion. Now in the, in the aircraft, inside the aircraft is essentially 400 hertz AC, AC is generated. So what, what do they, what they have essentially is a generator running at variable speed and they have a mechanical coupling which changes the, the variable speed to a fixed speed shaft. So that mechanical coupling has been uh, has been now replaced by power electronics. So generator now produces uh, variable voltage, variable voltage, variable frequency as the jet engine throttles, converted to DC first, and then generated by the uh, IGBT integrated base transistor or a MOSFET type of transistor to a constant frequency 400 hertz uh, power distribution within the aircraft. So, um, so these are in many, these are in very many kilowatt ranges. Of course, the aircraft has multiple redundancies all throughout, and such a system is is. But when next time you step into an aircraft, that's what you, you can see and uh, experience. And then the uh, Dr. Jetty. Yes. I, I just wanted to break in a second and give you a heads up that uh, that we're down to about uh, seven minutes or so. Seven, seven minutes. Seven yeah. minutes. Uh, a few more. So then now the automotive. Uh, powertrain has many of these power electronics components which are sprinkled all across in the car, including the wheel motor and wheel inverter and, and so on. Uh, the wireless charging is coming where you have a uh, coil, and coil in, in a platform and the car getting wirelessly charged. This soon, I think in the future, will transfer itself to electrical, electric charging lanes 
uh, in the highways. Not yet a reality, but I think it will it will happen in the coming years. And uh, we are looking forward to seeing the vehicle to grid when all the vehicles with batteries come into a building and park from eight to five. They could actually power the grid and then get charged before they leave. How EVs can power the, power the grid is something all the power electronics can enable that that aspect of it. So overall, the applications are are many. Energy savings, as um, as a slide provided by you know Dr. Baliga, uh, shows that the IGBTs themselves have saved uh, so many trillion watt hours of uh, cumulative uh, saved in gasoline and then uh, carbon dioxide emission reduction because of promoting energy efficiency. So the, I would say the future is bright for, for transistor as it, as it evolves further and further into many, many applications, including electronics and power electronics. Um, I would take the last few minutes to talk about um, a second topic, which I'm uh, working a lot with my students and applying the generative AI in education and looking to see many applications. Since I have very limited time, I will just show you a brief application about how the students are using, how, what is the next projection. So, so with the generative AI or a chat GPT, we call it now Google has helped Bard, as well as the, um, the Microsoft, um, the, the Bing has a, has a engine integrated into the search engine. You can ask many different questions to the Genity AI. Write me 200 words on power electronics applications. Yeah, it gives you responses. And uh, uh, this is maybe hard to read here. One of my students is reading, uh, asking it, hey, write me a summary of the following achievements. Uh, his achievements, he got these uh, awards and he's listing all of that. And then GPT is able to generate a a good narrative, take all his achievements and kind of write it out in a, in a, you know, with a large language model. He did not certainly like it. And he says, hey, can you make it longer? And um, we try to make it longer. So is it, so it's a continuous interaction with the engine. Can you write, rewrite it in the first person perspective as if he, he wrote it? And then again, he's asking, can you write it, you know, write an explanation to why uh, I should postpone my prelim exam. Um, he wants to write a compelling letter, a compelling email to a graduate advisor, how he should put, why he should postpone his uh, prelim exam because he's working in the industry and he's got a, so he wrote him a compelling, compelling essay here. Uh, uh, so uh, never seen many applications like this and says, write, write it in an email. And then he says, mentioned that the decision was made by my advisor, my advisor. So he's bringing my name into the conversation here. So there's many ways he's interact, people are interacting with the generative AI. And, and then he also did another thing. He took the, he took an IEEE paper already published and then um, uh, uh, changed the title and then submit it to turnitin.com, which I typically uses it, uses the Explorer to see how what the similarity index. Obviously, since he copied from an existing paper, the similarity index came out to be 100%. Um, then he went to generative AI and then asked it to rephrase it, ask it to write it in a scientific language and, uh, and many times back and forth. And he was able to reduce the similarity index without doing much uh, research or effort to 33%. So I don't know where this all, all, all of this will take us and where how the publication um, authentication needs to be. We need to probably invent a newer engine to see uh, where the, the, to check the originality of the, of the author. Now, jumping back to MATLAB, I think our students use a lot of MATLAB coding and so on. So here he's, a, he's asking, write me a MATLAB code to calculate the real and reactive power, imaginative power, and then he's giving it some parameters, and it, it and it, and then it generates a generates a pretty good MATLAB code, which he's telling me that yeah, it he, it minimized a lot of his work of writing it, and then it made a few mistakes, and then he was able to correct that. So, um, so then he also needed to type a lot of equations 
So you ask the generative AI to give him a LaTeX uh, uh, equation, the LaTeX form. He created a file, you point the generative AI to a certain, his own Google Drive, and then said, hey, read this, and then please pro take those equations and then rewrite them in my LaTeX format. So he can actually cut and paste it in his paper. So, so many, many different applications, I think. Um, so, so chat GPT is here. It's just a start. I was, I'm hearing news that uh, not only 4.0, but 5.0 will be here at the end of the year. So I would say it's transforming um, lots of industries, transforming education. I think in, at our university, we have a big discussion group. I'm a part of that. And um, it's only scratching the surface now. I don't know where we will go from here. Yeah. Yes, thank you. Uh, on a, thank you. On a, on a wide range of topics, uh, yeah. but some 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 deep material. Thank you both for uh, for joining us today and, and sharing your insights on, <clears throat> on uh, electron devices and uh, and AI as well. Uh, we did have one question. If we can work it in quickly, there was a note about uh, how do we best prepare our pre-university students to meet the AI workforce needs coming. Any any thoughts along those lines? Sure, I, I can just, uh, I, I think it's always uh, fundamentals. Uh, you right. have to build on a solid foundation. So so you have to, to get uh, your, uh, you know, basic uh, math uh, skills, uh, physics and science uh, to really build a strong uh, and be able to make the changes. Uh, I'm old enough that I was able to take one course in vacuum tubes <laughs> in my undergraduate. <laughs> And uh, many engineers were not maybe able to make the transition from uh, vacuum to solid state. Mm -hmm. and, and I think if you had the fundamentals, those that had were able to make that transition successfully. And, and I think that is going to be the, the enabling uh, foundation for the future. So whether it is uh, AI, you know, we have uh, circuit simulators that uh, a, when you're designing a chip, you know, it'll provide a full design, a turnkey. But the good designers are those that understand the physics of the transistor and are able to understand the limitations of the simulator and can really produce uh, one of a kind, more advanced designs than those that are just uh, turning knobs. So, so I think that's what you will always need to, in order to succeed. And with that, I'm sure a professor will have additional insights into this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I totally agree. I think I I'll, I'll look at all these new things as, uh, you know, going from a slide rule to a calculator to a programmable calculator. I think my dad was an engineer, he's an engineer, and he was always used slide rules. And he thought, oh, you guys are, your education is so simple. You have a amazing calculator and then you don't have, you can easily pass it. So uh, then you have the programmable calculator. Now you have the AI simulator engines and AI engines to help you. I think uh, finally, I think it's like uh, the, the one, one needs to have a solid foundation on, on math and physics mm. to be a good engineer. I think AI cannot replace those. Yeah, each, each, each step of the way, these tools are just used to make the, mo the next more advanced tool. Right. Well, th thank you both again for joining us today and for the uh, the Power Electronic Society and the Electron Devices Society for uh, for supporting us here in this session. Um, we are we are the last session for, for the day. So thank you also, especially to uh, to all the IEEE staff and Ada Kappa new staff and all the volunteers who have worked so hard to put together uh, TechX this year. Uh, it's been a great event and we've had a really good turnout, lots of great discussion and questions. And, uh, and I'm sure we'll spawn uh, many more questions and discussion after, the, after the, the session wraps up that we won't necessarily hear about, but we'll, we'll carry on nonetheless. Uh, so, so thank you all. We hope to see you again uh, at the next event. Uh, Nancy, do you have any closing remarks? Well, very much. Thank you so very much for joining us. Uh, thank you for these informative presentations. I mean, it's a lot of information we've taken in in the last 
last day and certainly in these couple of presentations, I was making a lot of notes for myself as well. Um, I really appreciate you, Ryan. Uh, Ryan's our IEEE president, APKN president-elect and did a lot to put together our panels and our sessions on this and our president, Sam Path, who is uh, off receiving an award at this moment. Mm -hmm. But I was writing down that the, the presentations will be available on the platform for the next 30 days. So if there was something else that you wanted to see, like the CHIPS Act that we talked about yesterday, or another presentation, you can go back into the platform and view it, or this presentation again. But really, thank you for joining us for IEEE at a Kappa News TechX. And if you want to know more about IEEE HKN, there's our website, hkn.org. And uh, we've got all kinds of things on our YouTube channel, on our website that can help inform and advise you. And if you're interested in becoming Ed Capanu, please uh, get in touch with us at info at hkn.org. Thank you very much.